بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله uh, Good evening everyone This is Dr. Adel Harbi On behalf of Saudi Pediatric Pulmonary Association and Saudi Thoracic Society I would like to welcome you all online virtually this time where we are going to, to have very distinguished speaker discussing very important topic. And this is one of the Saudi Pediatric Pulmonary Association e-learning series. And uh, I hope tonight it will be a very fruitful meeting where we'll have a very important discussion about pediatric pulmonary function test and how to make it very easy. To make it very easy for you, we invited very expert colleagues in this uh, field where they will make it easy for you. Uh, we have tonight Dr. Anoor Al-Khazlan. She is Assistant Professor, Respiratory Care Department from Imam Abdurrahman Ben Faisal University from Dammam. And also we will have Dr. Basim Kurdi. He's a pediatric pulmonologist from King, King Abdulaziz University Hospital from Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the talk will be divided into two parts. In the first part, Dr. Anur will present and then Dr. Basim. Uh, I think the talk will be very uh, interactive and practical. At the end, there will be a panel discussion. So if there are any uh, questions, please just post your question in the Q&A uh, bar, in the Q&A. By the way, this um, webinar is live uh, streamed on YouTube of the Saudi Pediatric Pulmonary Association YouTube channel, and it will be saved there for those who are interested to go back again. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome our speakers, and um, I would really appreciate their being with us today in this, you know, night of Ramadan where people are busy, and we consider this, inshallah, one of the zakah uh, uh, of, uh, of al-ilm, zakat al-ilm. Dr. Anur, Dr. Abbasin, thank you so much for you, and the floor is for you to present your talk. I wish you a very fruitful and very nice uh, um, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adil. Thank you, Dr. Adil. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee at Saudi uh, Pediatric Pulmonology Association for inviting me to present in, uh, to, uh, tonight. It's my pleasure to be part of this series. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Noor Khatlan, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Pulmonary Function Testing at Imam Abdurrahman Ben Faisal University, and I'm gonna to start uh, uh, talking about uh, pulmonary function testing with the uh, session objectives in front of you. Uh, I will go uh, first of all through uh, spirometry, what's the test, what it measures and patient preparation, and uh, the two uh, type of diagrams obtained from spirometry, flow volume loops and volume time curve. Then I will move to lung volumes and capacity, the distribution of them, and how it can be measured and pretest test pre preparations. Uh, after that, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Bassam will take the lead and he will go through BFT interpretation the pay for the baseline test and for the ver reversibility tests. Uh, what's a spirometry? A spirometry is the gold standard test in all pulmonary function laboratories, and it's the first test that uh, is requested from a physician in order uh, to, to be able to diagnose their patients. Uh, it's an invasive test that measures airflow, and the spirometer records the amount and the rate of air that the subject can breathe in and out over a period of time. So it only measure the airway function. Okay, it can be performed either sitting or standing, depend on the patient category. 
For example, pregnant women or obese patients, they, they, uh, uh, they do the test while they are standing uh, to um, avoid the, the, their abdomen uh, restricting uh, the diaphragm. Uh, there is some uh, instruction that need to be uh, um, uh, uh, that the patient should be informed about it before performing the test. Uh, in order to get an acceptable test that we can rely on and be able to diagnose our patient perfectly well. First of all, we should give this instruction to our patient when we schedule their, uh, uh, their pulmonary function testing. Uh, they, they should come to the pulmonary function lab wearing um, a comfortable clothing, not tight clothes. So they, they will be, uh, they will breathe freely without any restriction. They should uh, refrain from smoking at least one hour from the, uh, from the appointment. And they shouldn't take any vigorous exercise 30 minutes before the appointment. And they shouldn't have a heavy meal for two hours prior to the appointment. Also, we should inform them to withhold from any medication they are uh, taking regularly um, before the appointment. So if they are on bronchodilator, we will ask them to stop taking these bronchodilators eight hours before the appointment. If they are on corticosteroid, we will ask them to withhold from this medication 12 hours uh, from the appointment in order to get an accurate result that representative of lung function. There are five types of spirometry testing procedures that can be obtained from spirometer. These are slow vital capacity, forced vital capacity, maximum voluntary ventilation, peak expiratory flow, pre and post, and pre and post bonk dilator. The differences between a slow vital capacity and forced vital capacity is, uh, uh, is the way that the patient uh, exhale uh, the breath. So if we ask the patient to perform slow vital capacity, the patient, first of all, we always it's better to ask the patient to breathe normally, maintain a stable breathing pattern to get an accurate result. So I will ask the patient to start normal breathing. So I will ask him to do normal breathing, please. Then I will ask him to take a big breath in, then blow, but slowly. Why we perform this test? To be able, we perform this test at the end of lung volume measurements to be able to uh, measure um, uh, expiratory reserve volume and total lung capacity and resting lung volume. However, for forced vital capacity, I will ask the patient to breathe normally first. Then I will ask him to take a big breath in, then blow, but forcefully and rapidly. <sighs> So this is the difference for the slow, for the forced. So it should be forcefully so enable to, uh, to, to, for us to measure the force vital capacity for the patient. The resultant, the resultant curves or illustrations from spirometry, there are two forms. There is the flow volume loop in your left hand side and in your right hand side, the volume time curve. I will give you, uh, I will talk in detail about each of them. For the volume time curve, the, vo the volume will be uh, on the vertical axis in liters, uh, plotted against time uh, in the horizontal axis in seconds. Then what's in front of you, it's only the exhalation part. So the beginning of the test where the patient uh, maintain a stable breathing pattern and breathe normally, it's not illustrated here. We illustrated here only the expiratory part of the test. What, uh, what we should take in consideration here, we should take in consideration that the patient start exhaling from zero without hesitation, delay, or, or a leak or a poor effort in order to obtain an accurate forced expiratory volume uh, in the first second uh, of the maneuver. The second important parameter that we can look at in this, uh, in this uh, curve is the force vital capacity. Force vital capacity in which we ask the patient to exhale 
for adult patient for at least six seconds and for children less than 10 years old for at least three seconds then we can measure force vital capacity by plotting line from uh, the time uh, uh, from time to uh, on the curve uh, until we match uh, inter intersect with the with the volume curve then we draw a line here we can see that FEV1 is about 2.9 liter and FVC about 5.6 liter. However, what if the patient start um, uh, start this test inaccurately, or he's hesitating when he blow the breath, or uh, delay starting, or poor effort? We uh, either we ask the patient to repeat the test for us. However, if the patient always uh, starting uh, the test uh, lately or he has delay starting, we can make an extrapolation back extrapolation. It's a technique that we performed to uh, to uh, get an accurate measurement for FEV1 and FVC. What we can do is that we can draw a line tangent to the steepest initial portion of the curve. And so we will estimate here that the patient start from the zero point, even if he, if he has delay starting at the beginning. This is with the expertise you will be able to perform it several times and you, you will find it easy to perform. Moving to flow volume loop, flow volume loop is the most commonly used and reported in the uh, flow uh, in a pulmonary function testing report. In the flow volume loop, the volume, um, um, uh, the flow on the vertical axis plotted against volume on the horizontal axis and expiration always on the top part and inspiration in the lower part. We look on the curve to uh, several measurements or several parameters. These are uh, peak expiratory flow, which is the highest point that the patient can expire out of his lungs. And this is a very important parameter for patients with asthma. Other important parameters are the mid expiratory flows. These are force expiratory flow 25%, force expiratory fl flow 50%, and force expiratory flow 75%. Also, we can obtain from this flow volume loop force vital capacity. On the inspiratory parts, we can obtain similar parameter, but an inspiratory part, which, uh, which means um, uh, force inspiratory flows and uh, uh, peak inspiratory flow and, um, and uh, more other uh, parameters. Um, for the acceptability criteria for spirometry, we should obtain from each pay, uh, from each subject or patient at least a three acceptable force vital capacity maneuver. However, if we cannot obtain a three acceptable maneuver at the beginning, we will repeat this, uh, the test for the patient more and more, but maximum uh, of eight maneuvers can be performed for a subject in a one sitting. Why? Because we would like to avoid any problem with fatigue or any effort that might introduce bronchospasm. For, uh, uh, for the, rep the repeatability criteria, the largest FVC and the second largest FVC from the acceptable three maneuvers that we obtained must not vary by more than 150 ml or 0.15 liter. Also, the largest FEV1 and the second largest FEV1 from the acceptable maneuvers but must, must not vary by more than 150 ml. Here is some example of acceptable and, accept and unacceptable maneuvers. And I will point out uh, um, all parts of the curve if you, if you couldn't understand it earlier. Here, a normal volume time curve and a volume flow volume loop. For the volume time curve, as you can see, the subject is start exhaling starting from zero and the graph 
smoothly goes and uh, uh, goes uh, uh, until exceeding six seconds with a plateau and until the end of the test without hesitation, cough, poor effort, or uh, early termination or glottis uh, closure. For flow volume loop, it's the same as uh, subject start from zero without hesitation uh, or poor effort or cough, and he exhale until he reach the peak, uh, peak expiratory flow, then uh, mid expiratory flows appear very well and very intact without any scooping uh, or any um, uh, reduction in their value, which, in, uh, which is uh, indicative of uh, airway obstruction. So this, this is a normal uh, flow volume loop and volume time curve. Going to unacceptable maneuvers. Here, a maneuver with excessive extrapolated volume. As you can see here in the dotted red line, uh, the patient uh, hesitated when he exhaled. He exhaled uh, uh, with uh, poor uh, effort. So uh, it's less than what he should do. He should start from zero and exhale directly and until reach a plateau for more than six seconds. However, he delay and he has excessive extrapolated volume, which affect the measurement mainly for FEV1 or force expiratory volume in first second. Uh, on the flow volume curve, you can see here that instead of the patient exhaling from zero until he reached the peak expiratory uh, flow, he, uh, the, the curve, the curve in, your, in your right hand uh, and the dotted red line become submaximal, uh, submaximal than the uh, normal maneuver that the, should, uh, that the patient should perform it. Here, uh, another unacceptable uh, maneuver in which the patient blasts but submaximally, uh, less than what he should blast it. And this is, can be uh, clearly seen in the red dotted line. It's below the green line. For uh, the flow volume loop, the submaximal blast is clearly apparent because it's far below the, uh, uh, the, the, what's, the and what's the patient supposed to exhale. So if you can see a peak expiratory flow here for this patient, this is his uh, predicted value and this is, his actual, uh, this is his actual when he came to the lab and performed the test. This is not, be uh, this is not because he has um, a pathology, but because he uh, uh, submaximal blast or poor effort. Here, the patient cough in the first second, and it's clearly appear here at the beginning in the red dotted line. The green line is what's expected from the patient to perform. However, the red dotted line is what the, uh, the patient actually performed. The, for the cough, it's more apparent in the flow volume loop. As you can see, there is a drop down then going up in the flow volume curve, which, we, which will affect the measurement mainly FEV1 again. Here, early termination, the patient start from zero and he exhale, but suddenly um, stop exhaling uh, for, uh, there is several reasons for early termination, either the patient disconnected from the mouthpiece or he has a glottis closure or any other reasons. For the flow volume uh, loop, it's a little bit difficult to identify this problem. However, you might find uh, a steep drop in the, uh, uh, in the flow volume loop at the end of the graph. For the variable effort, it's difficult to obtain on the volume time curve. However, it's very apparent in the flow volume loop. As, uh, as you can see, the patient will exhale, uh, the exhalation will be increased, then it will drop in the middle and increase again. But again, it's lower than what's expected uh, to be performed by the subject. To differentiate between cough and variable effort, if we, uh, uh, if we said that this is uh, the cough on your left hand side, if we draw the actual flow volume loop, the cough will be outside the loop. 
However, for the variable effort, for the variable effort and early termination, if you draw the actual flow volume loop, you will find the uh, the variable effort within the the curve. So this is the difference between cough and variable effort and early termination. Cough it will be outside the flow the expected flow volume loop or the ideal flow volume loop, whereas the variable effort and early termination, it will be within the expected flow volume loop. There is another, uh, another unacceptable maneuvers. Uh, for, uh, it's, the, it's about the cessation of airflow, glottis closure, or breath holding. Here, the patient exhale um, and uh, suddenly the graph, instead of going, uh, of going up, then become plateau until the patient uh, for six seconds, it's, it's going down. This is will let us know that the patient having a glottis closure or cessation of the airflow. In the flow volume loop, there is a sudden drop at the end of the maneuver. At the end of uh, um, this lecture, inshallah, and Dr. Bassem lecture, there will be uh, there will be cases to be presented to make you understand this uh, very well, inshallah, uh, with with numbers and the graphs as well. Here, uh, the unacceptable maneuver as well, in which there is a leak uh, that's apparent by a dropping in the volume. Um, in the in the middle in the middle of the curve, instead of keeping the plateau over six seconds. And for the extra breath, it can be clearly seen as extra step toward the end of the uh, the volume time curve, and as extra a small graph at end of a flow volume loop. <clears throat> if we will talk about reporting of result. Once acceptable test results have been identified, the data to be used for the final report should be selected according to the following criteria. The largest force vital capacity and the largest force expiratory volume in first second should be recorded. After examining the data from all of the acceptable curve, even if they do not come from the same curve. A single test should be selected as well which is the test maneuver that has the largest combined sum of its value of FVC and FEV1. If we look at the effect of lung pathology on flow volume loop in particular, we can see on top of this, uh, on top uh, of this slide, a normal flow volume loops with normal exhalation and normal inhalation, and normal volume time curve with six to eight, uh, six to 10 second exhalation time. However, if the patient have obstructive lung pattern, there uh, we will, we will, uh, we will uh, notice on the expiratory part of a flow volume loop as scooped out or reduction in mid expiratory flows or reduction in forced expiratory flow 25 to 75%. Uh, also the ratio will be reduced. Here, because FEV1 will be reduced and FVC will be reduced, the ratio will be reduced below 70% in accordance with ATS-ERS recommendation. In this case, we will, uh, we will uh, say that the subject have obstructive lung pattern. In case that the, the subject have restrictive lung pattern, what will be affected mainly is the FVC. The FVC will be reduced and sometimes it will look like witch hat. The peak expiratory flow will be maintained sometimes, but the FVC will be reduced. It will be reduced from here till here, as you can see from um, right to, to left, but sometimes peak expiratory flow will be intact and it will be like a witch hat. And in this case, we can say that the subject have restrictive lung pattern or having interstitial lung, uh, interstitial, uh, lung disease or OPs or, or this is curve for pregnant women. 
if there is upper airway obstruction, either inspiratory or expiratory, it will be clearly appear on the flow volume loop. If it's, uh, if it's extra thoracic, upper airway obstruction, the inspiratory part will be affected. If it's extra thoracic, if it's intrathoracic, the expiratory part will be affected. So it's vice versa. And Dr. Basim will elaborate on that more, inshallah. Moving into lung volumes, the term lung volumes refer to the volume of gas within the lungs as measured by body plethysmography, gas dilution, or washout technique. It includes functional residual capacity, residual volume, and total lung capacity. The increase in these indices is indicative of gas trapping and or hyperinflation due to airway obstruction. But let us understand what do we mean by lung volume and capacities. Lung volumes, we have uh, normally four volumes and four capacities as a normal distribution of the lung, our lungs. The first volume is the tidal volume which is the volume of air breathed in and out, out, uh, out of our lungs during normal breathing. This is, we call it tidal volume. If we take a big breath in here from, from the end inspiratory level until maximum inhalation, this we call it inspiratory reserve volume. And uh, from, uh, from here till here, it's inspiratory capacity and on top of tidal volume is, is the inspiratory reserve volume. If we ask the patient to exhale forcefully or slowly, this we call it expiratory reserve volume. And after normal exhalation, the amount of air remain within the lung is called resting lung volume or functional residual capacity or intrathoracic gas volume. The amount of air that remain within the lung even after maximal exhalation is called residual volume. And the volume, all volume within the lung is the total lung capacity. These are the normal distribution of lung volume and capacities within the lung. How we can obtain these volumes and capacities? As I said earlier, spirometry can tell us only about airway function. It measures only the amount of air breathed in, uh, in and out of the lung and the speed of that air. However, for lung volumes and capacities, it can be measured using butterfly and nitrogen washout tests. For body plethysmography, it, uh, it depends on Boyle's law, which is study the differences between the pressure and volume within the lung. The test can be performed within a box, a glass box, like a telephone box, in which the subject is sitting inside the box and we close the door and we ask him to breathe normally while he put his, both hands on cheek and uh, maintain a stable breathing pattern. Then we perform airway occlusion and we close the shutter for a few seconds to, and ask the patient to breathe in and out as fast as possible, only for a few seconds in order to obtain intrathoracic gas volume or resting lung volume. Then we ask the patient to, uh, to have a slow vital capacity, a big breath in and big breath out slowly. The changes in pressure inside the box and inside patient lungs, it will give us a determination of lung volumes and capacities. Here's a diagram showing the actual procedure. Here the patient starts with normal breathing to maintain a stable breathing pattern. If he didn't start with this normal breathing, the subject might start to breathe uh, with unstable breathing pattern, and this will affect the accuracy of our measurement. It might give us uh, an overestimation for our resting lung volume or FRC. So we should establish a resting lung volume at the beginning of any test, pulmonary function testing. 
So after the patient maintains stable breathing pattern, we start uh, the uh, shutter closure and we ask the patient to breathe in and out, although he, he, he will not be able to breathe in and out because the, we, we uh, stop the flow. The flow. We, we apply the shutter and the shutter will be closed and the patient cannot breathe, but we will ask him to try to breathe in and out while he places his hand on both his cheeks. Then we will release the, the, uh, the occlusion and we will ask the subject to breathe, to, to perform slow vital capacity, either exhale the slowly, then inhale completely and slowly, or the opposite, inhale, then exhale. In order to obtain inspiratory capacity, residual volume, and total lung capacity. Whereas the FRC or resting lung volume, it can be obtained during shutter closure period only. Here is an uh, example taken from actual uh, patient. He's a pediatric patient, patient. We asked the patient to start with normal breathing. As you can see, he was breathing at higher lung volume. And if he will keep breathing at higher lung volume, this will give us a wrong estimation for resting lung volume. So we ask him to maintain a stable breathing pattern and breathe quietly, slowly, and continue with normal breathing. Then when we find him, stabilize his breathing, we apply the shutter closure in order to have accurate determination of FRC. Then we ask this, uh, the, the child to breathe in and out uh, slowly in order to obtain total lung capacity and expiratory reserve volume. We repeat the test for the patient inside the box without opening the, bo the, the door of the body box for three to four times. Here is the loops. And there is acceptability criteria for these loops. These loops should cross the zero line in which here a pressure is blotted against volume. The loops should be closed and without thermal drift or going outside, outside the screen. Here is the acceptability criteria and data reporting. My talk is purely technical. However, it will be more interesting if we will go to the cases, but you should first understand the technical part because if you will not perform the test accurately, it's useless to analyze unacceptable and unrepeatable test result because this will uh, misguide uh, um, doctors and patient diagnosis. For the acceptability criteria for the body box, the test should be repeated until obtain at least three technically acceptable measurements and the three FRC plate value, plate thermography values repeatable within 5% according to ATSERS recommendation. Uh, as I said earlier, normal acceptable loops are closed cross the zero line without thermal drift or excessive effort. Here, the thermal drift, it will be like this, and excessive effort, it will be a large and not closed loops. For data reporting, the mean value of FRC should be reported and used with the mean inspiratory capacity to work out the total lung capacity. Then the highest vital capacity is subtracted from total lung capacity to obtain residual volume. Moving into gas dilution techniques as another way to measure lung volumes, there are two types. I will not go in depth on these uh, uh, tests or techniques because of the uh, limited time given for us. It's, uh, there is two gas uh, dilution techniques, the open circuit multiple breath nitrogen washout in which we use 100% oxygen and we ask the patient to breathe normally. Uh, starting with room air, then we switch the valve and we will let the patient to breathe 100% oxygen to wash out the nitrogen out of his lung until nitrogen level drop below 2%. Normally, nitrogen level within the lung 78%, but we ask the patient to breathe uh, ox pure oxygen until uh, drop below 2%. 
The other test is the closed circuit helium dilution technique in which we give the patient helium and ask him to breathe in and out until maintain equilibrium between his lung and the machine. Now I will, uh, we will move to the interpretation part with Dr. Bassem and I will come back with you later and discuss some cases, actual cases or real cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anur al uh, Please uh, hang out. I'll uh, put my presentation, but like Dr. Noor said, she has uh, a number of interesting cases for you to go. And uh, I thank her because she's, she's made my life easier now as I hopefully will present to you, okay? Um, so this will be, well, sorry. So this will be my talk. I hope, um, please, 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 write your questions along um, in the Q&A section. And at the end, inshallah, we'll have time to go over at least um, some of the questions, if not, um, if not all of them, okay? So please write your questions as we um, go along and we'll have some time um, later um, to get to them, okay? And, uh, what else? okay, let's start. I'll be focusing on the interpretation. Okay, let me just uh, sure. I'll be focusing on the interpretation. Okay, so um, my name is Basim Kurdi. I'm from King Abdulaziz University. I'm an assistant professor of pediatric pulmonology. And uh, I hope that this will be simple and interactive. I know that there's not a lot of interactions directly, but when I'm asking questions, I hope that you take a minute and pause and try to think. Um, and imagine yourself also in another place because that's why I put the Hawaiian uh, um, beach. I passed by Cornish today for the first time in two, three months, and I missed the water. Okay, so just so we know, um, when we say pulmonary function test, that could mean a lot of things, okay? So spirometry and lung volumes are the two main ones that are gonna be talking about, and even more so on spirometry, less on lung volumes, um, like Dr. Um, Noor did. But there's so many other PFTs. So anybody, RTs, anybody who's a physician interested in pulmonology and lung function testing, there's so much to learn and help your patients. Um, diffusion capacities, uh, minute walk tests, MIPS and MEPS, uh, cough flow, cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a, fa a personal favorite of mine. Um, um, bronchoprovocation testing with methacholine challenge tests, um, phenos, um, and then th those in maximum volunteer ventilation. Those, the last three, those we usually used only in research purposes. So resistance compliant testing, uh, multiple breath washouts for lung clearance index, and essentially the last one is infant PFTs. So those three we didn't really use clinically. We use mostly for research purposes. Um, I'm not sure that at this stage they will become more than that, but everything else has a direct clinical impact uh, on your patient. So always people ask, so what are the indications for spirometry um, from a clinical standpoint? Really anything you can think of um, from a pulmonary standpoint is an indication. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, really talking to a pulmonologist is just all the indications that you need. Um, it's relatively quick, um, non-invasive. Younger kids will require some more time, multiple attempts, more coaching but then they will get, uh, they will improve at it. But just to go through it, there's a lot of diagnostic value in PFTs. When you have any respiratory symptoms or are not sure what's going on, you can, PFTs will help you kind of point to in a direction. Uh, I like Dr. Noor mentioned that, you know, when commenting on the um, PFT, she said, there's an obstructive um, pattern. And that's how she left it. And that's it, because PFTs by themselves are not diagnostic. You have to put the clinical picture with all the information that you have, but it's gonna help you assess for any patients who have abnormal symptoms or signs. Um, you're gonna, you can also screen patients for risk of having pulmonary disease. Um, and then there's a lot of data about assisting pre and post-operative risks and complications. Also prognostically, so other than diagnosis, prognostically, how do you expect that this patient is going to do um, in the future based on their current PFTs? You're gonna monitor them either to response to therapy um, or the progression of disease that you're treating or not treating. Uh, as a side effect of any other interventions, you need to kind of monitor for any um, 
complications that may appear. And there's a lot of also le uh, medical legal and insurance related um, and services related um, indications. So essentially anything, as I said, could be an indication of spirometry. Um, ideally, um, should be easy enough to do when you go to your pulmonologist to be set up. Uh, there is no 100% absolute contraindication for spirometry. It really kind of depends on the situation. There's um, in both of these uh, indications, contraindication is from the recent 2019 ATS um, ARS uh, uh, spirometry report. Um, so American Thoracic Society and European Thoracic Society. So there's a lot of relative contraindications. You can simplify it as the performing spirometry increases your intrathoracic pressure. So anything that you wouldn't want your intrathoracic pressure to increase with, probably not a good idea. Um, one, if there's any increased any hemodynamic instability, okay? If you, or cardiovascular problems, um, there's always some concern. There's a lot of details you can read. Um, we're not gonna go through the details. If there's any risk for increased intracranial pressures, intraocular pressures, so your eyes or your brains, um, sinus pressures, recent sinus surgery, um, problems in, again, with the intrathoracic, intra-abdominal pressures, recent um, pneumothorax, cardiac or abdominal surgeries, um, and lastly is what the big debate is now um, is infection control issues. Yes, when do you do, um, before it used to be like, oh, what about TB patients? What do we do with TB patients when they do spirometry? Do we do it when? How do we kind of disinfect the machines and everything and how we maintain the safety of the patient's family and the staff and also other more resistant organisms. So now everybody's talking about, oh, what we're gonna do with the COVID testing, a lot of PFTs lab have, labs have closed. How are we, when are we going to resume testing? How are we going to do that? So there's a lot to be talked about. Um, so how we do it, Dr. Noor did all the inf information you need. I'm not going to elaborate on the process, but all I wanted to just kind of see um, some pictures. So this is kind of the box. I don't know if you can see um, the marking. So this is the box of the plus, <laughs> plethysmograph where we put uh, the kids we can perform um, lung volumes. This is a kid uh, performing spirometry. So we tell them to squeeze, to keep kind of their hands on their cheeks um, when they do it. There's also nicely for kids, we use um, usually special software. So you see in this box, there's candles. So when the kids blow, the candles will kind of blow. This um, software here has a picture of a balloon. So you can actually, the more the heart the kid blows, the balloon will fly. So there's a lot of different um, softwares and also the equipment itself. There's the classical PFT lab grade um, labs like these, but then you'll also, there's like simpler office-based um, spirometry machines, just like you could, as a simple laptop, like you see here in the um, right upper corner, or even now there's some, there's new applications and kind of test devices that will go through with, through their phone or be like more portable um, to be decided on. Okay, so we're going here in the meat. So this is the, whoever wants to know more. So these are the American Thoracic Society recommendations for a standardized pulmonary function report. This is not per se the interpretation, but this is how a PFT report should look like. Okay, so this is again, easily um, look it up, uh, please. So we'll go through that. This is how a PFT report should look like. Okay, so this is, you'll see, we'll, we'll go through every part of this report so we understand what that means. Okay, Dr. So we did the test, now somebody's gonna give us a report. We have to know, what does this all mean? Yes, it sounds, it looks kind of tricky, but I promise you it's easier than it looks like. So the first thing is, we, you're gonna look at the patient's information, of course, the name, patient identifier, and of course, when was this test done? So those are the two kind of makes kind of duh um, questions. But then you have to look at some of the patient related data because that's how you have to make sure that they've been um, entered correctly because their normal values or the values that you're gonna compare with are based on these data. So those will be most importantly height. So height is a big difference in how um, in lung volumes and um, and different PFTs between patients. So you need to know their height, the age. So I don't know if you know that, but our lung functions usually continue to increase until our early 20s. And then it kind of goes um, 
to decline. That's why professional athletes usually also have problems kind of in the late twenties and thirties. You can't perform at the same level. Okay. Um, so early twenties is usually your peak. And then normally, normally, even in the absence of disease, your lung function will decline. Um, and then sex. So males will have higher lung volumes on average compared to um, females. And then lastly is ethnicity. Um, so Caucasians will have higher lung volumes than African Americans and um, East Asians, for example. So those are the four major factors that will play into um, finding your normal or comparison groups, okay? Now, we'll look into the data. So the first thing Dr. Noor talked about, she, the volume time curve, okay? So the volume time curve, um, like she said, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is volume volume in liters in time in seconds. In kids, we say you can go three seconds. In adults, we'll usually say, yeah, I want you to blow for six seconds or more. But in kids, we'll accept three seconds because usually they're able to empty out their lungs that fast and they can't maintain exhalation for that long. So we have here an example of three different um, diseases. So the light green one is the normal, okay? So this is a normal volume time curve. So you'll go here. And then this, if we assume that the FVC here is five liter, okay, so I'm writing this. So if you assume that this is five liter, so the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in, one, in the first second, how much air they were able to exhale in the first second was here. And this was four seconds. So you know now, if you divide that the FEV1 over FVC is going to be four over five, which is 80%. So this is your, or actually better yet is 0.8 rather than 80%. So that's your um, um, ratio there. Okay. So this is how you look. So that's a normal um, volume time curve. What happens if somebody has an obstructive disease process and it, it looks like this, the light blue. So you'll see here, they're not able to kind of shoot up and give out a lot of volume in the first second. Instead, they're just like continuing on. And sometimes they'll barely reach their um, end FVC. So this is how it classically looks like. Um, so the FVC has said five liters. So let's assume that he reached the five liter um, for the FVC. Again, the force vital capacity, how much he was able to maximally exhale. But you'll see here, he was only able to get out in the first second, two liters, for example. So We'll say 2.5 to make it easier. So 2.5 over five. So that's your FEV1 over FVC ratio is only 50%. So this child or patient has obstructive lung disease because he was only able. So what happens is in obstructive lung disease, normally, let's say, as I said, we have five liters in my lungs. I'm able to empty out the four liters in the first second because there's nothing blocking the way. That's what happens. Obstruction. There's nothing blocking the way. I can easily, the air leaves and then all the remaining time will just for me to empty out the last um, liter and reach the plateau phase. Now, if I have obstruction, I'm trying to empty out the five liters I have in my lung in the first second, because th the way is narrow, because there's a, for whatever reason, there's an obstruction um, in my way. I cannot empty out the 80% that I'm hoping to get out at least. So I can only get out 50%. So I can only get two and a half liters in the first um, second, and then it's going to take me the rest of the time to reach the, to exhale the remaining two and a half liter to reach that five um, liter FV, um, uh, FVC. So that's what happens usually with uh, um, obstructive patterns. Now, a restriction is usually easier. It looks like a normal shape in terms of the um, shape of the curve, but you'll see here that the FVC point is really small. So his FVC, let's say, is only three liters. So instead of reaching the, um, the goal or the normal or the average for, um, for him, which would be five. So this um, child is, has three liters at the end, um, but he's able out to let's say, he's able to get out like 2.8 liters in the first second. So again, there's no, no obstruction. He's able to get out 80, 90% of the air in the first second. There's nothing blocking the way, but he just doesn't have a lot to empty out a lot or a lot to exhale. That's why um, the end result is a small FVC. Okay. Um, this is the example from the actual report provided by the um, ATS. So if you look at this, 
what do you think is the diagnosis based on this volume time curve for our patient? Let's look at the blue, which is the pre. Again, um, I want you to engage and actively think about this. So his end result FVC is let's say four liters and his FEV1 is only two liters. So think about it and, look, and that'll be for you. The next one is the flow volume loops. Um, Dr. Noor also explained this uh, nicely. It's the first thing that we usually um, we'll look at to assess the quality, but also to give us a hint about disease state. So as we know, um, volume on the x-axis and then um, flow in liters per second on the y-axis. Expiration on top and then inspiration on the bottom, okay? The end volume, this is the FVC. So that's the force vital capacity, okay? So that's on the x-axis. You're gonna know how much did this uh, child exhaled uh, maximally um, in his uh, force vital capacity. And then usually we'll look at the peak expiratory flow. So that's how quickly was the maximal uh, flow rate that he was able to achieve. And that's usually within, um, again, the first second. So this is a matter of like pattern recognition. So you'll know that there's abnormal patterns that you'll just have to recognize. Um, and we'll go through a couple of them now. So this pattern here that you see on the right is the one from the um, ATS standardized report paper. And I want you again, actively engage and think, what would you think about this flow of volume loop? Is it normal? Is it abnormal? And what do you think it is? Here you go. So as we said, the blue is the pre bronchodilator, okay? So, So what do you think about that shape, okay? If we say that this is the normal um, classical shape. Again, this is for you. Uh, so let's go through this. Let's go through some um, flow volume loops and I want you again to actively engage. What do you think about this? Again, X axis, volumes, Y axis is your flow, liters per second. Uh, this is the predicted, so this yellow, like orangey, this is the predicted, so that would a normal um, uh, expiratory um, curve would look like. This is what the patient did. So what do you think that this uh, looks like? Again, there's multiple attempts and they've all been consistent with that. Um, so, so this is an example of severe obstructive ventilatory defect. Okay, so this is severe obstruction. Um, as I said, Dr. Noor um, have mentioned that this is, we, we usually will say that this is a ventilatory defect or a pattern. Um, we, if you want to be exact in your terminology, you don't say, I know people are saying it's obstructive airway disease. Well, we do not know if the disease process is in the airways, A, or B, if there's a disease process. This could be a normal variation or a lot of different things. Um, PFTs are not diagnostic per se. Think about them as, a, as one of the tests or um, radiological um, tests that you would be sending for a patient. You have to put them in context with the clinical picture. Um, so usually we'll say this is an obstructive ventilatory defect or an obstructive ventilatory pattern or something along those lines rather than saying, oh, this is obstructive lung disease or obstructive airway disease. Okay, so this one. Um, what do you think about this one? As, uh, we'll see. So you'll see the, um, this patient has both of these um, um, curves are done by the patient. So he did a pre and a post bronchodilator one. Okay, so this is why he has to. So the blue is the post bronchodilator and then the um, gold line is the pre um, bronchodilator. As you see, essentially it didn't make any difference, yes? So what do you think about this pattern here? He's, um, he appears to did okay in terms of his peak expiratory flow. Uh, the shape per se is on the small size, but, but the pattern looks normal. There's no obstruction, yes, because when you have an obstruction like that patient, you'll see the flow slows down. Yeah, like we just saw. So that will be an obstructive pattern because the flow rate keeps going down because it's so slow. You're trying to empty out your lungs, but you cannot because as I said, there's something blocking the way. So it's taking you longer and slower in order to empty out your lungs. But here it looks like there's nothing really obstructing your lungs. Um, you're able to go like, okay, here, I emptied up and then whew, I went quickly and I emptied all my um, lungs. I just didn't have a lot to give. So this would be a classical severe uh, restrictive ventilatory defect pattern. Because again, if you say that this is the FVC, this is somebody who has one liter as his um, force vital capacity. 
that's pretty small, especially if we thought that there's uh, for adults, um, let's say it's anywhere going to be like 4.5 or 5 liters. Um, so you force vital capacity depending on a lot of other factors. So one liter is pretty small. The pattern is normal. There's no obstruction to his exhalation. He just doesn't have a lot. He only has one liter. So this is how much um, time he needs to get out. Okay. So what do you think about this pattern? Now we have the predicted one, which is the gold uh, PFD. And then this is what the actually patient did. The blue line, there's some wiggly. That's the medical term, um, some wiggly line um, in his uh, exhalation um, at the second part of his um, FEV1. What do you think about this? Again, actively engage, try to think for yourself. What do you think this is? Um, let me kind of clear it a little bit. This is actually normal. Sorry, I know it sounds like a, like a trick, but there's, um, there's a lot of different normal shapes and that's something that we'll just have to kind of um, agree with this seems like it's a very acceptable um, um, curve. There's um, um, proper effort. There's really no interruptions. Nothing really of the significant errors that Tenor have mentioned here that says, oh, I should ignore this. He is, is actually able to kind of achieve a higher um, peak expiratory flow than what is predicted, which is fine. We're not going to punish him for that. So this is a normal um, uh, spirometry test. Oop. Okay, so the answer is there. Um, so here we only have one test. This is what the um, patient did. He tried, but he didn't really kind of peak. His slope was not really that um, sharp. And then he kind of like windled down. He didn't really um, do a good job with his um, exhalation. But usually when you see um, flu volume loop like this, this is either a marker of weak effort or neuromuscular and or neuro neuromuscular weakness. So he just simply couldn't, um, couldn't do more. Okay. Now, for this part that we're just going to talk about, so we talked about all these other things talked about lower airway disease per se, not per se, but um, the process of thinking about obstruction versus restriction. Okay. But now some of the other data that would be really helpful to know from um, flow volume loops are actually upper airway obstruction. Okay, so just some of the physiology we should know that there's, um, if you have an extra thoracic obstruction, so this is your thoracic, thoracic cage here, if you have any obstruction here on your upper airways where the um, red lines are, you'll see your pressure when you inhale on inspiration, the pressure in the trachea is going to be lower than the pressure in the atmosphere. So your upper airways are going to be more likely to collapse. So if you have any um, obstruction in your upper airways in the extrathoracic part, will be more likely to show during inspiration. When you exhale, the pressure in the trachea is actually going to be higher than the pressure in the atmosphere. So your upper airways are going to actually be stented open, and then you're not going to you're going to get better. You're not going to have the same symptoms. Now flip that, and if you look, if there's any obstruction in your intrathoracic airway. So if you have, um, so this is the thoracic cage here. And if there's a mass on inspiration, when you inhale, actually your lower airways expand and the pressure in the trachea is actually larger than the um, pleural pressure. So that's why your symptoms are gonna be improving. When you exhale and you have, again, as I said here on the right side, you have a compression or obstruction into your um, airways then when you're exhaling, those airways are gonna be collapsing and you're gonna be more likely to see the evidence of that obstruction. So how would those look like on flow volume loops? So the first one here, again, think active, what do you think? So the um, expiratory um, side is also flat and on the inspiratory also um, is flat. But these are usually classical fixed upper airway obstruction. A classical example, especially in kids, is subglottic stenosis. Okay, so this is a picture of subglottic stenosis. Um, the next one is, you'll see the kid was able to exhale normally, no problems there, but on inspiration, there was also flattening um, of his curve. So there's a problem when this kid's trying um, to inhale that got accentuated on inspiration, okay? So this is likely a variable extra thoracic obstruction and a classical example that we actually see a lot, um, or at least I saw a lot, was 
um, vocal cord dysfunction or paradoxical vocal fold motion where the vocal cords actually close on inspiration and give you a sensation of um, throat tightness and um, shortness of breath. Now, oh, the last example is what about, there's no problem with inhalation. I'm trying to exhale and then I get a flat. Um, what happened there? Something blocked me on my exhalation. And then again, like I said, classically, this is an intrathoracic obstruction. When you have an intrathoracic obstruction on exhalation, something collapsed in the airways. And the classical example in pediatrics is actually tracheomalacia. So you'll see, this is a scopic picture of um, tracheomalacia where there's flattening of the trachea. So these are kind of the most common. Now in adults, tumors could, be, could cause any of these um, um, things in addition to other um, clinical possibilities. But these are the most common that we'll see in pediatrics. So, so those are the flow volume loops, the volume term curves. Now let's see about these numbers. Okay, uh, what all of these things mean. Okay, so this is what happens. The force vital capacity is what Dr. Noor uh, ex explained. It's the maximal exhalation after maximal inhalation. Good dish, and I get how much I can exhale maximally. The FEV1 is the volume in the first second, and then we look at the ratio. FET is the force exhalation time. How much did I, how long did I exhale? So this is what the ATS actually recommends reporting. If you'll see actual reports, you'll see more data presented. Um, there's a lot of debate, and there's a lot of studies that confirms or denies the validity of different measures. So this is what there's agreement upon. And this is what you really need to know and what helps you. So the best is the patient's best effort. Again, we said he'll do usually three, if not more in kids. And then we'll document the best efforts. We'll talk about the LLN, which is the lower limit of normal um, in, with that Z-score. And then the percent predicted. If you're not a pulmonologist or not a respiratory therapist or somebody who is interested in that, the ratio percent predicted is really what you need to know. What is a normal percent predicted is, um, or a normal ratio is a big debate. Let's start with the FEV1, FVC ratio. What is a normal FEV1, FVC ratio? In kids, <clears throat> it's either 85 or 80. I go with 80 and that's what most places will do. But you'll see sometimes in different documents, 85% will be used or 0.85. 80%, so stick with 80%. You can exhale 80% of your FVC in the first second. So 80 is the normal. So having 52% or 0.52 is low. Okay, so this patient has obstruction just based on that. Okay, now let's look at the percent predicted. As we said, those percent predicted are based from reference values um, that are matched in age, height, sex, and um, ethnicity. So 54%, is that normal or abnormal? Again, if we're gonna use just by the percent, um, we'll go by 80%. So less than 80% is abnormal. Um, more than 80% is acceptable and considered as normal. Okay, so those are the two um, things. And as I said, adults would even use some different values, the FEV1 over FVC ratio and gold criteria for COPD is 70. Okay, so, and there's a lot of different reasons for that that we're not gonna get into. So for kids, just simplify things, 80%. 80% FVC, 80% FVV1, 80% for FVV1 FVC ratio. Less than that, that's abnormal, and I need to think about it. Again, what is normal is based on the GLI, the Global Lung Initiative, um, is the usually the most commonly used um, reference values, thousands, tens of thousands of patients that we have reference values that we compare to according, like I said, age, height, um, sex, and um, ethnicity. So that's what we use. There's others you don't need to know about. GLI was what we'll use. So for those who are future pulmonologists or pulmonologists, we just need to know that the lower limit of normal and the difference between the percent predicted and what are Z scores, okay? So it's prescribed here, described here um, on the diagram. So the percent predicted is your average for your matches, okay? So it says if, if the average is five liters and I do five liters, that's 100%. Again, so that's the 50th percentile. So that's the 50th, so, but we know there's, let's look at the right graph, there's a normal distribution, okay? Not everybody's gonna be exactly on the mean. So the 50th percentile is gonna be in the middle and that's what the percent predicted is using as a number. 
But we say that that's, we want something more, a little bit more specific, not as sensitive. Then we'll use the LLN, which is, if we say here, it's the fifth percentile. So the LLN, the lower limit of normal is actually the fifth percentile. So only 5% of similar peers have this value. That's exactly why we're using the lower limit of normal. 95% and more are actually have higher values than mine. So this is the fifth percentile. So essentially the LLN is using the fifth percentile instead of using the 50th uh, percentile for, um, for children. And this is well validated. This is the formal recommendations from ATS and ERS and what we'll be using and what we actually use in our labs. But for most generalists and non pulmonologists and people who do not usually lead PFTs routinely, the percent predicted is just going to be fine. But the LLN is what's recommended and what's usually used. Okay. The Z score is essentially your standard deviation um, difference from the mean. Uh, so skip this. So we want to assess the bronchodilator responsiveness. So they did this for this child. So we know that this is his. Um, best post bronchodilator. So we know that there's a percent predicted, it improved, but it will give you the percent change. And that's what we, what we care about. How much did the volume improve after he got his bronchodilators? Now there's a lot of different regimens for dilators. Um, so this kid's FEV1 improved 29%. Is that significant? Do we care? Do we not care? So yes, the, per, the goal is actually 12% improvement or more. So if there's an improvement of less than that, we usually don't consider it as significant. 12% um, and more or 200 mLs, that, in, uh, that will consider as significant. So that's how we say that this is a positive um, response to bronchodilators, okay? We usually used to say reversibility, but that implied that everything turned return to normal after, and that's usually not the purpose or the goal, um, but we wanna see that improvement. So that's the responsiveness. So the last concept is now going back again to differentiation between restriction, obstruction, and there's also rarely mixed patterns. So usually mixed patterns on PFTs are one to 2%. So it's not something you need to think about a lot or stress over. They like it in exams, I think, but um, you just need to know. For an obstructive pattern, you just need to know the ratio, like I said, that ratio will be decreased, as you see here. And the other thing that will be decreased is the FEV1. Again, like I said, you don't have, there's something blocking the way, so you can't get out that 80% in the first second. So the FEV1 is gonna be decreased, and then subsequently the ratio is gonna be decreased. Now the other va values can be normal or decrease or increase, but the two main ones that I want you to know are the FEV1 and the ratio. Now for restrictive disorders, the ratio is gonna be usually normal or even increase. So that's how the main differentiation point. But then the F VC is gonna be consistently decreased because you don't have a lot to give. That's the purpose. And then if you do long volumes, the TLC will be decreased. In mixed disorders, essentially everything is decreased. But you cannot confirm restriction or normal spirometry. You need to do lung volumes through um, the, bo the body box, the placidomography or other ways in order to confirm restriction. What you see on spirometry is just a possibility. <clears throat> so this is what happens on lung volumes. I'm sorry. <clears throat> a lot of values. The only one that I want you to think about is the TLC. That's it. The total lung capacity. So that's your whole lung volume. So that's your vital capacity plus the residual volume. So that's everything in your lungs. And then <clears throat> There is lower limit of normal, but it's not part of the GLI. And there's a lot of debate about using the LLN, not debate, but more people will use the percent predicted in TLCs. So the normal is 80 to 120%. Below 80 will say, oh, there's restriction. Above 120 will say, oh, there's hyperinflation. The lung volume is just increased, hyperinflation because of emphysema or something else. That's usually the best thing that, or the most important thing about lung volumes. I want you to know, you don't need to know this, but in lung volumes, in different disease states, the values are gonna be different. Um, in the, so all these numbers you'll see here, the inspiratory capacity, 
the, uh, the ERV, the FRC, the functional residual capacity, the residual volume, can give us that clue, in addition to the clinical picture, what is going on. We know what we expect for a young patient. We know as you, for a young patient, we know as you get older, your residual volume increases, your FRC increases, but your TLC more or less stays the same. If you have emphysema, your residual volume um, starts increasing, but if it's severe, your residual volume is gonna be huge, and subsequently your total lung capacity is gonna be the biggest, big. On restrictive lung diseases, if you have pulmonary fibrosis, then you'll actually see all the lung volumes getting smaller and small total lung capacity. But then we need to know with restriction, there's usually two groups, either parenchymal or lung uh, uh, pulmonary restriction or extra pulmonary restriction. So either the disease is in the lungs that is causing restriction or it's outside the lungs. And that could be in the form of um, chest wall problems either deformities, scoliosis, kyphosis, or even severe obesity, or there's a problem with your neuromuscular um, apparatus and you're weak. Your muscles are weak, your, your nerves are weak, so you can't really expand um, your lungs the way you're supposed to be. So restriction usually you'll have three big groups for restricted disease, but um, pulmonary or non-pulmonary, and the non-pulmonary are usually chest wall or neuromuscular um, diseases. This is the most important slide, and I hope it's the, um, and then I'll just uh, show you one example, but this is the most important slide that summarizes everything that we talked about. When somebody gives you a PFT and says, okay, read, and I know, and, or if you see a, an exam, okay? So the first thing you do is look, what is the FEV1 over the FVC ratio? Now, if you're a pulmonologist, you're using the LLN. If you're not, you're using 80% or 17 adults. I'm sorry for confusing. In kids, it's gonna be 80. So is it low? Yes, then I think there's an obstructive pattern. It's low because again, there's blocking the way I can't get out 80% in the first second. So I can quantify the obstruction. The ATS has what, what is like mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, very severe. Um, I think it's not usually that useful and a lot of labs have their own classification of severity. Um, the ATS recommendations are helpful for like legal and insurance purposes, but you can qualify the severity in terms of saying, oh, I think this is bad or pretty bad. Um, but anyway, we think there's an obstructive pattern. Then we have to look at the force vital capacity, the FVC. Is the FVC um, low? If the answer is no, then this FVC is low. If the answer is no, then this is pure obstruction. This patient only has pure obstruction. This kid, for example, has simple asthma. If, if you want FVC ratio is low, um, FVC is actually normal, and he has a pure obstruction. Now, if he has obstruction, okay, because the ratio is low, and then we go here, but his FVC is also low, his forward vital capacity is low, then we, if we have lung volumes, then we'll say, oh, do we know the total lung capacity? If we do not know, we'll say that this could be mixed, obstruction restriction, or could be just simply obstruction, we do not know. But if we actually have the lung volumes and we look at the TLC, if the TLC is low, then that confirmed that this is a mixed disorder because the total lung capacity is decreased. So there's obstruction and there's restriction. Could be from one disease process, or it could be from two separate disease process happening at similar times. Now, if the TLC on the lung volume is normal, then this is pure obstruction, okay? Then that confirms that there's no restriction and that could be an element of air trapping or um, something else. So that's obstruction and that's usually more common than um, restriction. Most common PFTs are normal, then obstruction, then restriction, then mixed. So that's how it goes. Now, if the ratio is not low, the ratio is either normal or even high. So we think that this could be normal or could be restrictive. We'll look at the force vital capacity. Now, if the force vital capacity is normal also, then this is normal spirometry. That's what we like, that's nice. Now, if the FVC is low, then we think, hmm, possible restriction. That's the restrictive pattern. Let's look at the TLC if we know it. If we do not know it, then uh, if we know it, then we'll go through it. And if it's low, then this is the restriction. And if it's normal, then that's the normal um, test. And if we don't have the TLC, then we can say that this is just a possible restrictive pattern. We'll try to get it in the future or repeat it or do something else. 
that's really all you need to know for that. Now, if we do lung volumes and there's restrictions, a lot of the time we'll, we'll get DLCOs, diffusion lung capacity, because that will help us also differentiate between pulmonary disease processes that are causing restriction versus extra pulmonary disease processes like chest walls or neuromuscular disease. Um, but I didn't want to add that to confuse things. I decided to kind of stay away from the DLCO in the meantime. Okay, I hope that this is, this is the most important thing. Um, no, this is the last exercise that I want you to do. These are my own PFTs that I did. Um, so you'll see the first thing here, the comment and the quality by the respiratory technician. There's the data, the weight, the race, um, the height, all the information, the, gen the sex that you need, the age, when it was done. Check. There's the flow volume loops, and then there's the um, volume time curve. Check. Looks normal? Sure. And then this is how it's presented on actual report. I wanted you to actually see an actual report. I did this um, last year. So this is my spirometry. I didn't do bronchodilator therapy. So that's why you'll see here the post bronch values if there, did, if there was, but I didn't do a post bronch. Um, so this is what you'll see on a spirometry for, for me there. Um, the most important values are the first three, the FVC, the FEV1, the FEV1 over FVC ratio. Now, I want somebody to actually come up and tell me what's my diagnosis based on what he sees. I'm not gonna tell you, that's just an extra bonus. And then we'll see we have a lot of other values. The forced expiratory flow, um, the official recommendation is you don't report them, you don't say them. A lot of pulmonologists will look at these, especially this FEF 25 to 75% as an indicator of small airway disease. I don't want to confuse you. Usually it's not asked during exams because there's a lot of debate about it. That's why. And there's a lot of strong opinions and not as good data about it. So that's why. Um, then the lung volumes, you'll see the slow vital capacity that Dr. Noor talked about. And then you'll see my TLC here, as I said, the most important one, and 71%, um, I gave you a hint. <clears throat> this is how a DLCO looks like also. I did my DLCO, and then it's uncorrected, corrected, and then the DLCO over the uh, alveolar volume, the alveolar volume, and then the inspiratory vital capacity. Um, also using percent predicted, we didn't talk about that. I just wanted you to see it. And then the most important thing, lastly, clinically, that you need to look is you need to look at the pattern, yes? So I did the test in 2016 and 2019, almost exact the same numbers, exact same percentage. So you'll see it looks like a flat line even. It's the same, nothing happened in two plus years. Um, so that's what you think about. You need to kind of compare the pattern because I know we say 80 is normal, 80%, let's say. Like in assume my FEV1 was 130%, it was super normal. And then I come to you and it's 100%. Now you'll say, oh, if you won, 100%, that's good. It's actually not good because this person lost 30% of his FEV1 um, from his last visit. So you have to take, you have to look into the pattern and see what happened. The highest FEV1% that I've seen was 137 for an Olympic swimmer, actually. Um, so you can be super neuromal because as I said, 100% is based on your average. But there are people who are beyond average who have larger lung volumes. So you can actually be at 101%, 120%, 137%, the highest that I've seen. For, but you need to make sure that you're following the pattern and how did that change? And then because that's the most important thing clinically, not just oh, how the absolute value is, or, or it, it wasn't below the uh, lower limit of normal, or the percentage is so-and-so. So you have to look into the whole picture in addition to the clinical symptoms, like we said. That's all I have. And I think Dr. Noor have uh, in a number of interesting cases for you. Um, thank you for um, being with me. If you want any additional reading about these, the, this book is an easy read. Um, read it during my training pulmonary function test. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure it, you can easily find by higher. Um, pediatricians can read the pediatric interview article. It's such a great article, 10 pages or so, you can easily read it. It's all you need for your boards. Um, more generalists, or you can read the Mayo Clinic proceedings paper on PFT reviews for the generalists. Also, again, 10 pages or so, uh, a nice summary for those who are um, interested in just in a basic understanding. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry that I went a little bit over um, time. If you have any questions, uh, this amount, but please ask through the Q&A, and now I'll give it over to Dr. Noor to go over some interesting cases. Thank you.
in uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Bassem, for your interesting talk. Um, now I will take you through some cases, then uh, we will answer your question in Q&A. Um, as Dr. Bassem said, uh, that we should follow uh, a certain chart uh, when we uh, interpret lung function data uh, that show us um, uh, starting from um, the ratio of EV1 over FVC, then we, we should look at FEV1, FVC, and lung volumes and capacities. I will take you through some uh, cases. For case number one, it's uh, a 52 years old man present with dyspnea, cough, and wheeze. He's an unsmoker with no rele uh, relevant occupational exposure. Uh, for this patient, uh, his ratio is, uh, we look always at the actual measurement at 68%, and his predicted is 80%. One of the questions in a QA, they said, how we will know that the child uh, make his best effort when he performs lung function testing? First of all, we should read the technician um, feedback on the report to make sure whether the child make his best effort. The second thing, we, we will relate patient actual data to his predicted uh, values uh, based on his height, weight, six, and age. So here for the FEV1 over FVC, it's 68%. And uh, if we look then, this is uh, less than 70%. So we will go then to FEV1, FEV1 is 64%. And according to the ATSARS recommendation, uh, 64 is uh, between 60 and 69, so it's moderate airway obstruction. So we classify this patient that he has obstructive pattern, then how would you, we, we will rate the severity based on ATSARS recommendation? It's a moderate defect because it's falls between uh, 60, uh, falls between 60 and 69 percentage. If we will go further, we will check does the patient have a bronchodilator response? We will look to the post bronchodilator. We will look at FEV1 and or FVC. We should see, uh, find a percentage change of 12% at least at 12%, uh, where, uh, with uh, absolute change of 200 mil. So for this subject, he has a percentage change of uh, more than 12%, and abs uh, the absolute change uh, 3.19 uh, minus, uh, minus 4, it's, um, uh, it's, it should be more than 200 mil. So yes, this patient, he has a bronchodilator response. So what's the most likely diagnosis, do you think? This patient, uh, we, we think that he has, uh, according to his history, of course, and other, uh, other uh, clinical uh, symptoms with his lung function testing, he might have asthma. If we will go to the second case, a 60 years old man present with dyspnea on exertion, he has a 40 pack per year history of smoking, and he has no other complaint. If we look at his lung function, first of all, as we just said, we will look at the ratio of EV1 over FVC. The actual is 47%, which is obstruction. Then we will look at FEV1, FEV1 percentage 25%, 25% falls uh, uh, below 35%, which is very severe airway obstruction. Then if we will look uh, um, at lung volume, uh, lung volumes, we will see that the uh, total lung capacity is 117 and RV 248. So this patient have air trapping. Does the patient have a bronchodilator response? As we just said, that FEV1 and or FVC has a percentage change of more than 12% and absolute change of more uh, of 200 mil. And this is uh, uh, all uh, in this case, applicable in this case. So yes, this patient have a bronchodilator response. If we will take another example, we have a 25 years old man present with dyspnea and wheezing. He's a and then a smoker two years uh, 
ago, he was in a major motor vehicle accident and was hospitalized for three months. He had a tracheostomy placed because he remained on a ventilator for a total of seven weeks. This is his flow volume loop. And how would you, uh, you would uh, characterize the result of his pulmonary function testing? As we said, first thing, first step is to look at the FEV1 over FVC, it's 54%. This is obstruction. Then we will look at FEV1. It's 69%. 69% is a moderate, moderate airway obstruction. Uh, so moderate obstructive pattern. Still on the same case, based on the flow volume loop, how can you further characterize this patient pulmonary function abnormality? Try to remember what Dr. Bassem just showed you about the examples. Uh, this, uh, the, um, the reduction in expiratory loop and inspiratory loop um, consider as a fixed upper airway obstruction. And this is because of the, uh, the, the placement of a tracheostomy for seven weeks. Here is the examples that Dr. Basim show us, and we apply it on this case. The, for a figure number A, it's variable intrathoracic obstruction in which the expiratory loop affected. For B, it's variable extrathoracic obstruction in which the inspiratory loop affected. Fixed airway obstruction, both loops will be affected. And for differential emptying from two lungs, it will be, uh, it will be like figure D. Going to another example, a 30 years old woman present with two months history of dyspnea on exertion. She's a lifelong non-smoker with no prior pulmonary problems. First of all, we will look at the ratio. The ratio is 91%, so it's normal or restriction. This is the first example for normal or restriction. So in this case, we will look at FVC. For FVC, it's 40%. Okay, so it's reduced. We will look at the total lung capacity, total lung capacity 44%. So reduced again. So for what, do, what you would classify pa this patient pattern? This patient pattern is a mixed obstructive and restrictive pattern because both FEV1 and FVC reduced along with the total lung capacity. Case five, a 50 years old lady underwent a screening pulmonary function testing. She has never smoked and has no medical complaint. How would we classify her case? We will look at the ratio, the ratio 73%. It's normal or restriction. Then we will look at uh, um, FVC. So FVC 102, it's normal. We will look at total lung capacity, it's 130 normal. So this is normal spirometry and lung volumes. FEV1 also normal, 95%. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Bassem can join me to answer your questions. Please, Dr. Bassem. Thank you, Dr. Anur. Thank you very much for the time, inshallah. Uh, so, Dr. Bassam, would you like to go into a question and answer uh, bar and um, answer their questions with me? The first question for you, Dr. Bassam. Yeah, just over. Let's see. Um, okay. The first question is about uh, using the impulse oscillometry spirometry um, as a replacement for the normal procedure of spirometry. Um, Dr. Noor, I don't know what's your experience. We've only I've only used that as a in in a research study once or twice, to be honest. So that's not been, um, there's not a lot of up uptake. Now, the technique has been there since the 50s or 60s, it's been decades. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of uptakes for a lot of different reasons. I, the, the benefit technically is that you don't have, you don't need a lot of cooperation and you can mm -hmm. do it in young kids mm -hmm. uh, or that's kind of the theoretical part. But I think for me that there, we don't have good reference values. We don't have standardized techniques. There's not enough um, studies on it. And then a lot of the outcomes for all the disease states that we deal with clinically have been studied and well-established based on force vital capacities, force expected volume, FEV1, and a lot of relationship to different mortalities, different um, morbidities, a lot of limitations. 
the, the output from the iOS is resistance and reactance. It doesn't provide you with volumes per se. So I just cannot see that that's gonna take over. We're even gonna be, that may be a secondary option in special situation for you to help you assess some things clinically, but maybe I can be surprised, but I'm just, I don't see that that happening in my even practice time. I don't know if Dr. Nori have any opinions also about that. Uh, I totally agree with you, Dr. Bassem. I rarely see iOS in practice. We have it only um, in experienced uh, workshops, but I never uh, have it with my patients. Uh, do you want to? Okay. Uh, there is one question also, Dr. Bassem. Uh, there is um, uh, somebody asked about chemotherapy. Would it really affect spirometry pre and post chemotherapy? Um, uh, from my search, yes, it would affect, uh, it will increase the FEV1 and FVC. However, it will decrease uh, um, the diffusion for carbon monoxide. This is from my experience, but I don't know uh, about, uh, I don't know about you, Dr. Bassam, if you have any experience with chemotherapy patient. Yes, actually, in a lot of uh, patients who are studying chemotherapy, depending on the chemotherapeutic protocol that they're going through, they're actually, a lot of them will have standardized um, surveillance PFTs as part of their management. So they will get a baseline and then we'll follow them depending on the situation, the clinical presentation, every three, six months or, every, or annually, as long as they continue on therapies. Um, bleomycin is the big um, kind of problematic one for us, or Valua. Um, for, uh, bleomycin, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, um, long list of possible chemotherapeutic agents that has um, pulmonary toxicity. So in those patients, ideally, you would get a baseline and then you will monitor them some, on, again, with the agreement of oncology. Some of them have some sort of recommendations. A lot of them are based just on local practice. Um, but yeah, you'll see them, you'll see those side effects. Um, that's why you want to detect them early before it's too late because a lot of them are not reversible. So you want to, just by stopping the medications, so you want to, that's why we monitor them by PFTs before they become symptomatic. Mm. Okay, there is one question about would it possible to perform uh, BST for COVID-19 patients and um, uh, from an infection uh, control point of view. From my experience, I used to work with um, uh, CF patients, CF children. We use it in a negative pressure room at the end of the day, and then we sterilize all the equipment and clean the laboratory. Uh, this is to answer the question from uh, Basmal Belushi. Uh, if you would like to choose any other questions, Dr. Basim, and answer about uh, I'll answer them. No, I think also there's a good question that also might be um, helpful. So, for so how do you know if the child is performing the test accurately? Yes. Uh, maybe if he's pretending. Um, I'm sure you'll see this kind of more. From my perspective, uh, I think the respiratory um, therapists are usually kind of better at the bedside in terms of recognizing what's going on in coaching the child. For us, when we get the results, again, we as usually kind of will assess the quality of the, in a lot of the stuff that you talked about, and then kind of gives you a clue what's going on, but um, you might have more to say. Um, okay, uh, doctor, there is one question. They said if the patient has severe asthma and enlarged goiter and will undergo general surgery, how to say he's fat? For adult, it's FEV1 value more than one. Uh, so um, from point of view, Dr. Bassem, uh, what do you think if he has severe asthma and enlarged goiter? Do we need first to treat his asthma before uh, he underwent any surgery? Yeah, I mean, actually all patients with asthma, regardless of the surgery that they're going with, um, they need to be um, well controlled on their, um, on their, um, on asthma management. Now, yes, ideally you'll have normal um, PFTs. Now it doesn't have to be one, i.e. I'm assuming that means 100%, um, but it doesn't usually have to be normal. It just have to be, um, it, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean have to, it doesn't have to be 100%, but it has to be normal and has to be stable for some time. And then depending on the severity of the asthma, we actually sometimes, we have our own process just to start like either steroids or in bronchodilators, even prior pre-op and post-op. So there'll be a plan with that. So they just need to see their um, pulmonologist. When I heard the goiter, I thought about, oh, we'll be asking about um, upper airway obstructions on PFTs because that could happen in adults. It's not something that we'll see uh, um, in kids, but that's something that I've read about. You'll see um, either fixed airway obstruction of source on the PFTs. 
We have to stop by this. The time is uh, limited, and you know today is 26 later, Most of the people probably want to go back for prayer and dua. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, watching this very fantastic and great talk, informative, very useful. I do recommend people to go back, especially their trainees, residents, fellows, to go back to the YouTube channel where it's, it, it has been saved there as a reference. Thank you so much, Dr. Basim. Thank you so much, Dr. Anur. I do appreciate your effort and you have been good as tonight. أتمنى من الجميع أن يعني هذه الليالي المباركة أن يغتنموها وأن يكون لنا ولكم خالص يعني الأجر في هذه الأيام الفاضلات كما تعلمون هذه الملتقيات بمسمى مبادرة وفاء وهي من ضمن حملات الدكتورة مها الدباغ رحمة الله عليها زميلتنا التي توفت في شهر أكتوبر الماضي هذه مبادرة وفاة من زملائها في جمعية السعودية لطب جراحة طب الصدر لدى الأطفال لعل الله أن يغفر لها ويرحمها ويصلها الأجر في قبرها وهذا الحال حالنا جميعا بإذن الله نسأل الله لنا ولكم التوفيق وشكرا جزيلا من الأعماق للجميع نراكم على خير وشكرا ولقائنا القادم بإذن الله على الوبنار حيكون يوم ليس قدا ولكن بعد غد حيكون بدياتلك سليم ميديسن it will be the last um, uh, webinar during Ramadan, and then we'll resume after Ramadan, inshallah, after Eid. Shukran jazeelan, tutmuhun ala khair, wa fi amanillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jami'an, Ramadan, barak, wa Eid, barak, inshallah. Allah yahmiikum jami'an, wa yahfadna, wa yarab, yirfa' al- al- الغم عن الأمة مثل ما يقولون يعني إن شاء الله عيادة تكون سعيدة دائما ومباركة وشكرا لكل الأخذ من وقتهم عشان نحضر دكتورة نور صراحة سعيد جدا يعني بالحضور معك تعلمت كثير من كلامك وبإذن الله يعني تحصل لنا الفرصة في المستقبل يا رب شكرا لكل الحضور وإذا عندكم أي أسئلة عن طريق الحسابات أو الطرق الأخرى بإذن الله موجودين نعتذر إنه إحنا ما قدرنا نجاوب كل هذه الأسئلة شكرا جميعا بإذن الله تعالى شكرا جزيلا لكم شكرا لك دكتور باسم I really enjoyed the session I benefited a lot from your knowledge وإن شاء الله بإذن اللقاء وشكرا جزيلا دكتور عادل for the invitation and the and staff Faisal العتيبي for organizing the session شكرا جزيلا للحضور والمستمعين الله يعطيكم العافية جميعا شكرا جزيلا